first or one of yeah. the first ones ever. So, <coughs> but that's that's uh, the kind of shows how this field is expanding in a, uh, many very many ways. But regarding these kind of basic questions like uh, science, is something uh, it somehow seems to me that this, uh, how we study the world there is a kind of changes of potentials and of course risks related to that too but what is in natural sciences and related sciences like medicine the scientific method is something which I think is somehow falling kind of from the kind of uh, the, uh, developments and so the kind of the method has been or the methodology has been built on a time when we were using just pens and paper so to say right and then one now we can deal with thousands of variables and large numbers of data points even in the case of numerical data and let them along going towards the language and these kind of culturally oriented right. contexts and data so I guess this sci scientific thinking needs to progress. That's right. Yeah, and and and, and it is a, it is a challenge, and like it is interesting uh, <clears throat> having having been inside inside like many many companies in, in Silicon Valley and seeing that of course ultimately as in science, I mean like one of the basic questions is about like establishing these causal relationships. That like you do something and like. Like what are the what are the outcomes that are actually caused by the action that you take, and not yes. just correlations, and 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 that is of course in the very core of the empirical science and 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 the, and, the, and the kind of the empirical method, um, and like like and one of the best ways to do that is, is to organize controlled trials, randomized controlled trials, and, and 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 it is interesting that like now that given that the importance of like being able to kind of. Uh, uh, like figure out and establish these causal relationships. Not only so important to science, but also for many commercial interests as well. Mm -hmm. There's like a lot of, lot of effort is, is put into that, and like how, how we can actually like make it make it more more like operationally efficient and so forth. But at the same time, we are like seeing the, the very limitations of the method, as as you pointed out, and and like uh, it is definitely extremely powerful in the in the in, in, in some applications, like where you can like organize the trials and where you can collect the data and like where the data is of the desired kind. But I mean, there are like so many other interesting problems that are just impossibly hard to measure in this way. Mm -hmm. And so, it, <clears throat> like I remember from a project that we had, my friend Professor uh, Mika Panzer, and he organized us to have a chance to have data about was it two uh, hundred thousand people, kind yeah. of their their measurements, and then they had had a problem that the medical experts and so on, they were, were not very keen on studying the data because it wasn't kind of collected in the right way, so to say. Right. So that, that's, but then the question is that if you have a uh, hundred or thousand data points or then you have hundred thousand or million data points, so what should you really do? Yeah. So that's the kind of setup. I, I, it seems to me that we need to take more kind of carefully the consideration regarding these kind of uh, data sets which are not kind of collected in this kind of uh, within the framework of the scientific method but the kind of uh, it seems that this is the only way that yeah and it is it is an it is an interesting question and I guess that was and still is the kind of the big promise of the idea of big data that like you just gather and collect these like lakes and then and, and petabytes and, and, and of data and, and then like you can, you can apply different methods and, and, and something useful will come out and often oftentimes it is true and, uh, and oftentimes like you pointed out I mean like the results can be way more powerful and significant than what you can do in a control setting in, in other t at, at other times I mean just the fact that like the data collection process might be biased by itself mm -hmm. might, might produce something that is misleading uh, uh, unless you are like really careful yes and, and really being careful, like careful and understanding and that's why it's this kind of even a philosophical la layer is, about absolutely. the epistemology what what do the things mean and how the like the causality that you referred to and so on and uh, the question is also about the context mm -hmm. so that the, if we have only a small number of variables we don't have context for the right. phenomenon but if we have hundreds and thousands of variables those form a context for the thing that we are studying and looking at and that that's why I, it seems to me that the quality and quantity 
are kind of approaching each other in, in uh, thanks to these kind of approaches uh, that we have. Yeah. And and there are and um and, and like in many cases the um the kind of the, the that the problems that we are willing to solve are, are guided by the data that we have available. Mm. So it, it is interesting that since you mentioned the question of context, it, it is true that like having having more let's say variables is definitely helpful. On the other hand, like the world is such a complex place that like although you may have like lots of depth you know, along some dimension, you are totally missing out many other interesting dimensions. Mm. And, and then you have to be really careful in understanding the data you don't have and that is really the extremely big challenge that it is so hard to analyze the data you are missing. So. Wouldn't it be actually that I think uh, many times people also wish to think that they really govern and ha handle the things around mm -hmm. them and because that brings security. Mm -hmm. So in a way we are also learning machines to say it in a, one way or uh, kind of systems that try to get hold of the world and we have direct experience and we have indirect experience like our parents first kind of start to explain we learn language through imitation and so on right. so but anyway we have always by definition a limited uh, view on the world and there is much that we don't kind of see and then we have this problem that the world is changing all the time right. intentionally or non-intentionally by kind of different kinds of forces and combinations of these forces so there's this what is called non-stationarity right. so that the kind of statistical point of view the model needs or it's kind of by definition is always at least to some extent flawed mm -hmm. if, or would, would you find to absolutely to uh, yeah i mean the the, the question of, of of time horizon i mean the the, the kind of what you mentioned about non-stationarity and the fact that um, oftentimes if you look at how, how typical prediction tasks work these days uh, you collect some data about the past and you try to predict the future right and and now almost out of pity it happens to work when the time horizons are short enough that like you took at like look at like maybe depending on the application the past 30 days of data and you try to predict the next 30 days maybe at that time scale i mean it, it, just out of luck i mean the data is stationary enough that it works but then like trying to do anything at the, at the longer period of time like whether you go into history when it comes to collecting training data or you try to predict further away in the in, in the future I mean, then of course, I mean, things start to fall apart. And that is a major challenge to many of these bigger questions and societal questions that like, well, maybe maybe for predicting ads and then movie recommendations, being able to see 30 days ahead is enough. <laughs> yes. But I mean, like many of the things that you and have mentioned. And the weather for five days. Exactly, so exactly. But I mean, like, it's a very small subset of problems that we should be interested in. So. Yes. So, and there ha there's this discussion about AI being dangerous because it's, conscious or whatever and takes over and so on but at least to me it seems a bit uh, foolish even for the moment so it's our intention so the ones who want uh, to have some particular system for a purpose so that intention is there to guide the development still uh, Absolutely. rather and I'm, I've been always really fascinated uh, I actually like remember that we published a paper at your uh, AKRR conference about the how how these methods at the end of the day are tools yes. and how taking very consciously the idea that like they are extensions of, 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 of human beings and, and human societies and like well maybe maybe some people are afraid that they, they start taking kind of a, or gaining consciousness of their own but another point of view is that like they are really like tools I mean just a very fancy very advanced tools that mm. humans can actually use for their benefit and really the best Best combination is that, like, when you can like um, use use the kind of the human cognition in combination with with some of these methods. Yes, yes, it was the, the, at the time when I was the AI uh, society's chair, and you contacted for me for the first time, uh, ninety seven or so. So uh, it was the time when people were really concerned about AI too. So right. even yeah. at that time, yeah. and uh, now there's some relevance in it because of course it's kind of taking the jobs of some people like yes. uh, the cars are not uh, kind of driven by humans anymore at some stage and so on. But the question is also anyway that the kind of human understanding is something which still uh, goes over our kind of the fact that we are living creatures mm -hmm. with our kind of experience of the world so that makes a kind of 
really fundamental change regarding right. the autonomous uh, kind of capacity of ours and then the whatever genetic algorithms or uh, all kinds of systems that we uh, can have around us. So right. they, they are kind of simulations of those capacities, right. not and the often capacity that's itself. Very shallow ones, yes. The shallow, shallow ones yeah. in that sense. Of course, the more we increase this kind of complexities by adding adding these kind of uh, robotic features, so such they they kind of can bring bring some unpredictability, so to say. Yeah. So that and but I think it's not the main major concern even nowadays. Right, right. And and there, I mean, what you mentioned about having this more kind of a embodied experience, maybe with with robots. I mean, there the interesting question is is kind of a it's kind of like a Wittgensteinian thought that, like, um, that in a sense, I mean, maybe maybe these machines end up being more like animals, and like Wittgenstein said that, like, uh, even if lions could speak, we couldn't understand them. A letter, letter Wittgenstein. Yeah, that's right. Yes, <laughs> exactly. It, it, uh, yeah, ma makes a big difference. Yes. Um, that, like, the, the representations that you can learn in this world, I mean, like, might not always match with the ones that, like, we have. Yes. And it is actually an interesting challenge be because it all also means that, like, even if we are able to develop these machines. It might never feel that we had quite gained the AI because even though these machines work perfectly and they do exactly what we want, we don't quite understand why mm. they behave the way they do. So. And that's why this explanation capacity, it has actually been, it must be even, I came to this field in the 80s, but it had been a point of discussion even the, with the rule-based systems that how do the systems explain their actions and choices Absolutely, yeah. and with neural networks <laughs> and multi-layer neural networks and so on so that's even more a question yeah. but then the question is also that we don't know each other's kind of uh, yeah. systems and we don't know even our own kind right. of processes so the cognitive processes are definitely such that we can't say why we chose to do like this and not that, yes. because it's this kind of... Uh, Which I think like results to human-to-human -human conflicts oftentimes, that you just don't understand the other person's intentions 